Hey everybody, it's Business of Design and I'm your host, Kimberly Selden. For the record, I'm an interior design professional just like you, so this podcast is really an opportunity for me to learn new things that I can implement into my business. And although it's not the sexiest topic we've ever explored, I do today want to talk about how to minimize taxes. I mean, why not? Uh, None of us wants to pay more than our fair share. And I, in particular, am in a socioeconomic group that is heavily taxed. Uh, I'm not a large corporate entity that has money hidden in the Caymans, and I'm not a low-income wage earner. I believe I should pay taxes because I happen to live in two great countries, but do I want to pay more than my fair share? No, absolutely not. Do I want to leave tax benefits that I could be reaping the benefits of on the table just because I'm ignorant? No, I don't. So that's why this conversation that I had with certified public accountant and tax coach, by the way, Craig Cody is so interesting to me. Now, this is going to be a two-part conversation because, frankly, there's only so much tax information I can take in in one episode, and because I think you're going to want to implement some of Craig's suggestions before part two, which will be episode number 83. Craig and I spoke in August, which happens to be my year end as well. So the timing couldn't have been better for me. In part one of more money for me, yay, we are going to look for, or we are going to look at rather five of what Craig refers to as the 10 biggest tax planning mistakes uh, that cost business owners money. And that means you and I, business owners, interior design business owners, it costs us thousands of dollars. My intention uh, was to squeeze all 10 into this show. So, uh, but I found the conversation to be riveting and I did not want to throw great information away. So again, it'll be a two-parter episode 83, just around the corner. I also, by the way, reached out to my own accountants, uh, which I said I would do after having spoken with Craig and I had some questions about my year end and a couple of tax advantages I wanted to make sure I was going to be able to take advantage of, specifically the generous 20% qualified business income tax break, which you are going to hear Craig talk about. So in my world and yours, a benefit of 20% can mean a substantial amount of money in your pocket quick bio on Craig and then housekeeping messages from Cheryl Horn and we're right into it. Craig Cody is a certified tax coach, a certified public accountant, a business owner, and this is cool, a former New York City police officer with 17 years on the force. So that's an amazing service. Thank you for that service, Craig. In addition to being a CPA for the past 15 years, he is also, as I said, a tax coach, and he'll tell you what that is at the end of the show. He belongs to a select group of tax practitioners throughout uh, North America who undergo extensive training and continued education on various tax planning techniques and strategies to become as well as remain certified. With this organization, Craig has co-authored an Amazon bestseller book, Secrets of a Tax-Free Life. It's that time again, Cheryl. You always have good announcements for us. What's happening? (laughs) Well, you stay really busy, so there's always a lot to mention. Um, But High Point is coming up really soon on October 12th and 13th. Um, You'll be heading there on the Friday um, to do a live podcast with some of our members. Uh, Some of them will be joining you on the podcast, but it's going to be an open room that anyone can join and, and listen in as, as you record that. So, And then the next day, you'll be appearing at the theater on stage as part of a design panel. All right. So if you're going to be in High Point, make sure to let us know. I don't want to be hanging out there by myself. I don't have my team with me this year. Um, and then Texas, I'm, I'm, this is really happening now. We're doing Austin, Dallas, and, and Houston. Houston. Three cities, uh, two days. <laughs> Three cities, two days. We need like a t-shirt, like people when they have a concert, (laughs) you know? Um, The Business of Design Tour 2018. Um, The meetups are free and they get pretty lively in terms of the conversation and the discussion and what's going on. And uh, come on out and let's use this time to move your business forward. Yeah, the last few have sort of turned into group coaching sessions, just an open discussion um, with uh, your local designers, um, but they're filling up quick. Some of the spots have limited numbers, so make sure you're registered. Um, So again, that's October 25th and 26th, and you can register at businessofdesign.com. Oh, right. We're glad you're here. Thanks, Cheryl. Talk to you soon.
Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Business of Design is the coaching community for independent designers like you. We know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate business challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses plus Kimberly Selden as your mentor and guide. Unlike traditional coaching, which can take years to produce tangible results, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $67.50. Annual members save two months and have access to Kimberly's contracts. What are you waiting for? We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. Well, two things everybody loves, summertime and talking about taxes. <laughs> yes, yeah, in that order. In, in that order, exactly. So this is, this is what I'm going to refer to as an eat your vegetables episode, where we're really going to talk about some things that probably aren't exciting to a lot of us, but can make a big impact on the bottom line and our own financial health and success. So first of all, tell us what you do for a living. So I'm, I'm a C, I am a CPA. All right. Um, I'm also a certified tax coach. And what that means is I basically specialize in looking for ways for clients to keep more of what they make. So do it legally. And uh, we run a CPA firm out of New York and we have clients uh, across the country. So can I just go out on a limb here and say, I'm going to guess that most interior design professionals are not maximizing their opportunities when it comes to tax savings. Am I right? You're correct. Just like um, they're no different than most other business people. Okay. So I just, I'm just curious. I'm going to ask this question right off the top. What mistakes are we making across the board? Like if you had a list of five mistakes that we could think about right now that would change our bottom line, what would they be? Okay. So I have over 10 mistakes and I wrote a book um, that we will offer your listeners for free. But um, the, the biggest mistake is failing to plan. You know, everybody, they're going to buy a car, buy a a piece of equipment there. They do research and all that stuff. It comes time to tax season or tax time. They've kind of buried their heads all year and they go see their professional typically in maybe March or April. And, you know, they've done no planning to see what can I do that might've saved me some money. Okay. So I have to ask right off the top, what kind of planning can I do? So <clears throat> what you should be doing <clears throat> is you should be communicating with your professional throughout the year. All right. So you, your book should be updated so you know your numbers and knowing your numbers helps you make more money. Knowing where you're spending it, wh- where you're making it, um, that's that's good metrics as for any business owner. Then having good numbers and communicating back and forth with your CPA, if he's the right person or she's the right person, is going to um, help you figure out other ways that you could actually keep more of what you're making instead of giving it all to the government. So it sounds like most of us would benefit from a quarterly, at least, if not more often, check-in on our dashboard. Most definitely. Um, You know, most of our clients we do monthly, but, you know, quarterly at the very least, you want to, you know, you want to look at your numbers and you want to have a conversation and you want that person to tell you things that you should be doing. Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on track, and we're going to definitely ask you about the other mistakes, but this is just taking me down a rabbit hole, which is when I hear people say, you need to know your numbers, what numbers do I need to know? Because you know, if you have some software program, there might be 50 different categories you can look at. What are the most important numbers I need to look at? Well, well I, there's a lot of different important numbers. So there's where is your income coming from? Is it coming from one specific demographic, one specific industry? Uh, Should you be spending more of your marketing dollars there? So let's just say I'm spending all my marketing dollars across, let's just say, five different industries. And I'm getting income just from one industry. Maybe I should spend most of my marketing dollars against that. At it, one industry, because that's where I'm getting my return. Um, another thing is, you know, looking where you're spending it and, you know, what are you getting out of what you're spending? The same thing, it could just, I'm, I'm just talking about marketing, but it could be anything. You know, um, I'm spending marketing here, but I'm getting nothing for it, but I'm spending marketing here and I'm getting a lot for it. Maybe I should spend it there. Employees, uh, consultants, independent contractors that are working for you, how much are you paying for them? How much revenue are they producing? 
you know, what, what does that number look like? What is your industry average typically going to be? Should you be, you know, billing out and collecting three times, whatever you, you're paying, you know, um, that person, you know, what, where are you? And if you don't have good numbers, you can't do that analysis. And that analysis can really help your business move. Sure. Because if you have three different plumbers that you work with on a regular basis and you see that you are making a 30% margin on one plumber, but a 10% margin on the other plumber, you can either have a conversation with the plumber you're not making enough money with, or you can switch your business to the one that who is the most profitable for you. Correct. Assuming they both do good work, but just being able to look at it can, can really help you. And we're not even talking about tax planning here. We're just talking about, you know, simple things that business owners should be doing. So I get that we need to look at our expenses and where the money is going. And you mentioned that there might be five different revenue streams in a typical business. Most interior design businesses, maybe there's one or maybe there's two revenue streams. But still, if you, for example, do staging as well as decorating and 85% of your money is coming from decorating, then that's a big clue as to where you should be spending your marketing dollars and how you should be positioning yourself in the world. Correct. I agree with you. Okay. So what what other numbers do we need to look at when it comes to revenue in? I mean, there's so many different things you could look at. You could see, you know, is it coming from referral? But having the more granular that information is, the better it's going to be for you to make, you know, very good um, business decisions. Right. So depending on what you're doing, so you you may be an interior designer and you may have an office here, you may have an office in Florida, um, you're paying all this money for space in Florida, but you're really not getting anything out of it, you know, or maybe you're getting fewer jobs, but they're higher ticket jobs. Mm-hmm. I once uh, I was recently speaking with a designer who said that a hundred percent of her referrals and leads comes from one builder. Should that make you concerned if you're noticing something like that? It certainly sent up a red flag for me. Yes, I mean I, I agree with you because God forbid that person gets hit by a truck. You know, where's your business? You know, any business you want, you don't want to be. You know, have one source of the vast majority of your money. Okay. So when, when you talk about planning, you really mean you need a procedure, you need a system for an ongoing review of your books. And I know the resistance in this particular community is so strong, so often that the sole proprietor feels that they can't afford that professional, that they have to do it themselves. And I would say that I'm not good at it. Uh, so I'm not going to do as good a job at it. And I would also say if they're working directly on a client file, you can bill out that time. So what would you say to that small proprietor who's thinking they can't afford that bookkeeper to help them create a plan for their annual tax review? Well, I say, look at what, what is your expected ROI on what you're doing? So if, if, you're, if you're spending your time doing, let's just say, $10 an hour work and you could be doing $80 an hour work, obviously, uh, as long as you have the work, you should be doing $80 an hour work. Uh, additionally, you know, I always tell people, don't look at your accounting fees and this expense item. Look at them as an income item because if you're working with the right people, they should actually be saving you money and that gives you a good ROI. So it should be a positive ROI. So are they saving me money because they're helping me be prepared when I have that annual meeting with my CPA? And are they also saving me money by pointing out expenses that might not be working for me? Are there other ways that they're saving me money? Well, they they should be saving you money by, number one, allowing you to focus on what you do best, which is interior design work. So that's the first place when you have an internal person. Um, When I talk about ROI, I'm talking about having somebody, an external person that you're working with that is going to help you. You know, that's somebody that's going to be proactive with you and you're paying to provide you a service, but that that service is not just costing you money, it's giving you a return on your investment. Right. Okay. All right. So we're just, this is just our first mistake that we're just, we're not planning. And it may be in many cases, we're not planning because we're just so busy. 
hitting the ground running every day, trying to keep all the balls in the air, um, that it always yes. feels like it's just one more thing and we can't handle it. Exactly. And, and uh, uh, honestly, I, I have never run into somebody that when they've actually hired somebody to take that low level work away from them, they haven't done much better. Right. Right. Exactly. That's what I found too. I found that that person who's not an interior design professional, who loves numbers, who loves the math, who gets a thrill out of the, the equation and the puzzle of all of it. And then that person was able to do not only the inputting of receipts, et cetera, but also was able to prepare purchase orders, was uh, interacting with my suppliers, making those purchases on our behalf, uh, tracking those purchases, billing the client for those purchases, notifying me when the client had not yet paid for those purchases. Like that person, it becomes a critical, critical income producing member of your team. So I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, that might be the very first hire you ever want to make. I agree with you. Okay, good. Okay, that was just one mistake. I'm already exhausted. Just, yeah, you're, that's just one. <laughs> that's just well, one. Um, the second one is is not, we, we really won't go into it too deep. It's audit paranoia. That's like being so worried. Wait, I can't do that um, because somebody told me I'll get audited. But meanwhile, the tax code says you can do it. Right. So I always say, if code says you can do it, document it. Document that you're doing it correctly and do it. See, I wouldn't, I've never had that thought, oh my gosh, I might get audited, except I I do know a few people who have been audited. And one thing that surprised me, and you'll tell me if I got this wrong, they had to have not only the visa receipt in, in a situation where they purchased with a credit card, but they also needed the original receipt. Is that still true? Um, I have not seen that. Okay. I've never seen, um, an order to look for that. Now I tell my clients, if it's a, if it's a big ticket item, definitely hold on to that. The regular receipt, um, most receipts these days, everything is electronic. You could pretty much get what you need to get, especially when it's paid by credit card. But if it's a big ticket item, definitely get that receipt. You know, if it's, if it's um, a client meeting or a client dinner or something like that, and you know, you don't have that receipt. Okay. Um, we typically tell clients, take those receipts, stick them in a, in an envelope and just at the end of every day or at the end of every week, just stick them in the envelope. You may never need them. Um, but Personally, I've never dealt with a, a client in an audit where they wanted the actual, in addition to the credit card. Now, okay. depending on what it is, maybe if it has dual use, yeah, they may want to see that. If it's, you know, if it's a clothing store, but it can also be, you know, hospital scrubs or something like that. Yeah, I would have that receipt. Because if you're buying scrubs at Nordstrom's, you know, it could also be clothing. Right. Okay. And so if you have your receipts, if you have a copy of your receipt in a digital format, that is just as good as having an original printed receipt. Is that right? Yeah. I I can't see the service uh, giving you a hard time about that. Yeah. Uh, The other thing I, I have seen a couple of times is people will mix up their personal credit card with their business credit card. And that seems to cause a lot of confusion and aches and pains. So should you be really disciplined about that and have a dedicated business card? Well, let's, let's talk. Yes, you should have a dedicated business card that you only put business items on. But let's talk, talk real world, especially maybe somebody that's not quite that large. They may have one personal card that they put business expenses on and personal expenses on. As long as the deductions that are business are, are the only ones that are, they're writing off on their business, I don't have a problem with that. Um, the service, the IRS also knows that not everybody can get a business card. So they may need to use a business card a personal card to purchase business transactions, but you don't want to be writing off or attempting to write off your veterinarian bill. Right. All right. So make sure that you're only writing off the deductible expenses that are on that card. Okay. So, and what if you take a client out to dinner five years after the project is over? Is that a write-off? <laughs> oh, are you talking 
if you're talking business and you're trying to, you know, get more business, yes. Okay. Do you see that? Do you guys all need to go and take out those best clients you've had in the past for dinner and make that work? Okay. So, so none of us wants to get audited, but it would seem to me it goes back to the first mistake we make, which is failing to plan and not having those people in place. Because if I did get audited, I would immediately go to my bookkeeper and say, over to you. Correct. And, and you should be, if you do get audited, you should be working with a professional, a licensed professional that can communicate with the IRS. You know, just like they tell you, you know, God forbid you get, you know, accused of a crime or, or the police want to talk to you, you should have an attorney. If the IRS wants to talk to you, have your CPA handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I've seen enough Netflix shows now to know that no matter what it was, I'd say, I want my attorney. (laughs) I don't care what it was. Oh my gosh. Okay. Number three. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. As somebody that's a former law enforcement person, I would definitely say, you know what, you know, protect yourself, have an attorney. Okay, good. We don't want any of our listeners to end up in the big house. So uh, I think that's really good advice. (laughs) Okay, number three, number three mistake we make when it comes to saving ourselves some money at the end of a year. How about choosing the wrong business entity to operate out of? Too often people, they they start a business, um, they want to, you know, make it official. So they go and they Maybe they contact an attorney, maybe they go online and they form an entity and no real thought goes into it. Just that Johnny Jones said, yeah, form an LLC or Johnny Jones said, you know, form an S corporation or they'll speak with the attorney and the attorney will be looking at it strictly from a liability perspective. And he'll say, okay, in your estate, let's form an LLC, but maybe have your CPA and your attorney have a conversation and see if there's a way to actually have your cake and eat it. So have the best entity that's going to work for you from a legal standpoint and also have the best entity that's going to work for you from a tax standpoint. People will ask this all the time. Do I need to be incorporated? What do they mean when they're asking that question? I think when most people ask, do I need to be incorporated? They're talking about liability purposes. I would think so. That's the way that's the way I answer that. And I'm not a, an attorney, um, but I think having some protection, some, whether it's an LLC protecting you or uh, an, a corporation or an S corporation is a good idea, but that's a discussion you should definitely have with, with an attorney. And, you know, in, in most instances, it's not going to cost you a whole lot of money. So that's the legal liability protection. But then there is what's the tax implications of being an LLC, an LLC taxed as a sole proprietor. Um, taxed as a partnership, uh, 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 an LLC taxed as a corporation, and a corporation, an S corporation. So there's so many different ways you can choose to be taxed and operate as an entity. And some thought should go into there because me and you can be in the same business, but we may have different things going on in our life from a tax perspective. One entity may be good for you, it may not be good for me. Okay. So so bottom line, yes, you want to speak to uh, an attorney to figure out how to make sure you're protected in a liability sense, but you also want to speak to your CPA because it's possible that you could, you could have both protection and the best tax advantage. Correct. And let's have the, the three of us on a call together. Okay. Short one. I like that. I like that. You know, I'm like, I'm just kind of channeling what I'm going to um, expect as some of the resistance, uh, which is I'm not big enough. I'm not a big enough firm to have an attorney and a CPA. But the reality is the minute you're walking into someone's home and you're taking their money, you have an incredible amount of liability and responsibility. And so you really owe it to yourself to make sure you're protected. Correct. And you don't have to have that attorney on retainer. All right. And, you know, I'm in New York and, you know, uh, other than LLC filing charges and stuff like that, that are, you know, fees you have to pay to the state and for advertising. I mean, most often you're paying somewhere between 500 and a thousand dollars to let's say set up your entity to, for, for the legal perspective part of it. Right. And if, uh, if you're listening to business of designing, you're taking our advice, you're definitely charging enough money to afford that. So you don't even have to worry about that. You just step it up and, and protect yourself. I'm a hot mess because I am a, a dual citizen now, American and Canadian, uh, with property in both countries. So nobody wants to touch, to touch my taxes. It's so, it's so complicated. Why. It's a three tequila conversation when I go to have this, you 
you know, the rules change on one side and then they change on the other side. Anyway, it's a moving target, but I, I really am getting a lot out of this conversation. So the, the fourth mistake we make, what would you say is that is? The fourth, fourth mistake is a relatively new one, and it has to do with the new tax code and new changes that were enacted at the end of December, and it's called qualified business income. And basically what that is, is, you know, Congress created something under Section 199, which means certain businesses and interior designers appear to fit into that would get a 20 percent, an extra 20 percent deduction off of their net profit. So let's just say that business nets one hundred thousand dollars on your personal return. You would pick up that hundred thousand dollars, but you'd also pick up another twenty thousand dollar deduction. So effectively, that hundred would turn into 80. Wow. So there's a couple of, yes, exactly. Wow. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, a couple of hoops. Really? This is, wow, this is amazing. I've got a conversation scheduled with my accountant in the next month or so. So I'm going to be so smart when I bring this to his attention. That's right. I, I'm, I would really, really hope that he's aware of it. Yeah. Me too. Um, <laughs> yes. Me too. I'm calling Craig. Um, so, so, and, and there's a couple of hoops that you do need to jump through. Um, they're not hard hoops, but there's, it's limited. That 20% is limited to, uh, 50% of wages. So somebody has to be getting paid, or if you're a sole proprietor, you are, that would be your wages. So, um, that shouldn't be a problem, but often we'll see people that have formed companies and they haven't taken salary and, that could create a problem now with section 199. So the, the government is really going to be looking at what we call reasonable compensation for you know business owners to make sure they're taking what is reasonable compensation. And that will flow into the deduction that they're allowed to get on qualified business income. So, um, you know, $20,000 deduction can, you know, easily be, you know, $2,500 in your pocket. Oh, yeah. And um, the reason you wouldn't take a salary is that, uh, for example, you might defer taking the salary until the end of the year when your accountant says, this is how much I think you should take home. This is how much you should put into retained earnings. Is that the reason you wouldn't take a salary? Well, as long as you take that salary by December 31st. So once the year has passed, if you're not meeting with your accountant until January, February, March, it's kind of too late. So, and like I said, I'm a big fan of communication. Communicate with your professional. The doctor doesn't call you up to say how you're feeling. All right. You need to call him and you need to communicate and, and start that communication with your professional so that you guys can have a back and forth and he can help you or she can help you, you know, really, um, get the benefits out there that you deserve. Right. I anticipate a lot of CPA phones ringing uh, in the next short while as people are saying, I need to have a conversation with my CPA. Um, Really, that is somebody who's on your team and is there to help you, but there is this sort of going to the principal's office feeling about those meetings sometimes. Yes. And and the the more you have those meetings and hopefully you don't feel that way, you know, as, as they become more regular. So it's just another, it's just another conversation with a business advisor. Let's talk about number five. Okay. That would be missing the home office deduction. So that's another one where the, the, there's a conspiracy theory out there that, you know, if you take the home office deduction, you're going to get audited. So if you take the home office deduction, you need to have space inside your home that you use exclusively for your business. You need to document it. You need to use it for at least 15 hours a week. Now, I don't know anyone in business that doesn't do at least 15 hours a week worth of work from their home. Even the ones that try and try not to do it. Okay. Right. I myself yeah. try not to, but I'm spending a couple of hours every morning when I get up very early answering emails and stuff like that. So I think we all do it. I, we need to document it. And so what does that do? That helps us a little bit. You know, we get to deduct certain things um, that we would already be deducting, such as our uh, percentage of our mortgage interest, a percentage of our real estate taxes, which comes into play now under the new tax bill. Um, Real estate and state taxes are capped at 10,000. So here you might get a little bit more of a deduction. Um, And it also opens up the window to to deduct other things, such as now travel from one office to the other from your home office to clients. And the one that I love, it opens up the home athletic facility, which could be your home gym or your home pool that's available for the use of your employees and their families. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. Yes, that is a wonderful thing. 
and it's in the tax code. We thought we were going to lose it under the new tax changes, but they got it back in there at the last minute. Okay, so we all need to be thinking about the overall health and well-being as we're doing our day-to-day work and talk to our accountants about that as well. Correct. So now a lot of designers, um, when they're first starting out, they will take over a portion of their home as their home office. It might be a big chunk, like let's say the basement. Is your deduction based on the size of that footprint? Okay. Correct. It's you take that versus the overall size and that's what you get. I love that. You mentioned your very first book you had, which became a bestseller on Amazon. Um, What's the new book? What's the title of the The, new book? The new book is the 10 most expensive tax mistakes that cost the business owners thousands. And we will give you a link for the show notes, which is basically my website forward slash uh, business of design. And that'll take uh, your listeners to a page where they can opt in and receive a paper copy. Very exciting. And you also are a professional tax coach. Yes, I am. Yes. Tell us what that is and how does that differ from a CPA in terms of a relationship you'd have with a tax coach? So the, the typical CPA is interested in putting the right, in, right numbers in the right boxes, and it kind of ends there. A tax coach is looking to do proactive planning with you to figure out ways to keep more of what you make. Oh, I love that. And so when people hire you, is it an annual thing that they hire you for an, a, a one-year uh, contract or retainer, or do you have different packages? How does it work? So the way it works with us is um, the first thing we do with the client is we have a conversation. We see what's going on. Um, We would ask them to send uh, copies of prior year tax returns. We would do an analysis to see how much we could actually save them. And is it worthwhile for them and for us um, to move forward? If that's the case, um, we would propose a tax plan, which they pay us a fee for that's 100% refundable. And in about seven and a half years, nobody's asked for their money back. After we do a tax plan, if they would like to work with us going forward, uh, all our clients are on a monthly retainer and um, we go through our whole process where we talk with them every month. We do their bookkeeping and tax work. These kinds of things feel like something you would do if you were a bigger corporation. But in fact, absolutely nobody is stopping you from being the big corporation if that's what you want to be. Correct. We all have the opportunity to keep more of what we make. I can't imagine anybody not really loving that message. So thank you so much for your time. Check out our book. Um, I I think you'll find it useful. And uh, if we could be of any help, definitely reach out to us. Okay. All of Craig's information uh, is in the show notes. And Craig, we end every episode with something we call design intervention. And often um, the advice that the professional gives has nothing to do with the topic we just discussed, but it's something you've learned in your experience as a business owner that you think is really important to people listening. Well, I mean, I I hate to, it's all about cash flow. How's that? That's (laughs) something I learned a long time ago. You know, um, you need money to pay your bills. And if it all comes in, in December, it's hard to, you know, put food on your plate. Um, so um, there's something I learned a long time ago is it's all about cash flow. We need to have a consistent, you know, flow of money coming in, which means we need a consistent flow of um, clients coming in and a consistent flow of leads generating those clients. And we need to be consistent about collecting the invoices that go out. That's been my experience with design professionals. They invoice, but don't necessarily follow up on when that check is coming. And weeks go by, sometimes months go by, and suddenly you find yourself in a position where you can't pay your bills, which is just not a good thing. So cash flow means a good system for logging the time that you're working on your client's Uh, projects, a good system for billing your clients, and a good system for collecting those invoices. Correct. And and sometimes a good system could be, you know, automatic billing, you know, your your credit card is going to be charged 15 days after the invoice and stuff like that. Um, But everyone has to do what they're comfortable with. Okay. And and by the way, a great bookkeeper can certainly handle all of that for you, which is, I think, such a gift. So, uh, There's lots of resources out there if you're willing to step forward and take them. And Craig, you've been tremendously generous. Thank you so much. I appreciate that you're giving everybody that book. And uh, what exciting new things do you have coming up that we all need to be uh, looking for? 
Just um, it's it's tax planning season starting up the last three months, four months of the year. And um, we're just, you know, really looking forward to saving our clients more money. So, you know, they have more set aside for retirement or doing the things that they want to do. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me. Make sure to join us in episode 83 for part two, numbers six through 10. Have an amazing week, everyone. Thank you for being part of the Business of Design community. If you love what we do, please show your support by subscribing to the podcast and rating our efforts. Remember, you can be a part of the podcast by sharing your comments, ideas, and questions via the BOD hotline at 416-780-9187, extension 107, or by sending an MP3 file to info at businessofdesign.com. And when you're ready to transform your business and your life, sign up for a monthly or annual membership. Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today.